Now that we humans have evolved to such a sophisticated level, now that we've advanced in the science and study of psychology, can we discard the trappings of religion and leave it in the rearview mirror? After all, isn't religion, specifically Christianity, just a psychological crutch for those who haven't attained a greater sophistication? What do you say to the person who looks down his or her nose at your Neanderthal religion? Let's talk about it today on this episode of Craving Answers, Craving God. I'm Chuck Rathard with Aaron Miller. Aaron is the pastor at St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. Aaron, statistics indicate that more and more Americans do not identify or subscribe to denominational or non-denominational religion. They are called nuns. Why are people, at least people in the West, leaving what they think is the obsolete institution of organized religion? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I think it's probably longer than a three or four minute discussion. We probably should do a whole episode on this question about the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, people who have no, that when it comes to um, organized religious affiliation, they don't have any, they're, they, they're nuns. Um, well, I can just say real briefly though, I think a big issue is uh, individualism. Uh, we here in the West have been told that the individual is the most important thing, way more important than community. And uh, people resent then being a part of the structure of community. Structure of community always provides uh, boundaries. Uh, there's always – every other person that you come in contact with in a community is a person that you can't move, That that is a, a barricade, a, a, a blockade to your purposes, unless you learn to live within that. But that takes rules and structure, and if we're convinced that the individual is the most important – Groups like a church, people are bailing on all sorts of groups. I, you know, the Masons are, are declining as well in their numbers, and all sorts of fraternal organizations, and um, because people want to be in charge, and you can't ever be completely in charge in a group. Now, this is exacerbated, and I think this is even maybe more of the problem. The church in in America has spent. Um, well, quite a few decades now, maybe even centuries, catering to this sense of individualism, peddling a Jesus whose main job is to give us individual fulfillment. And um, some people will bail on that because there's no, there's, there's no reason to be told you have to come to church and be a part of this group and live in the authority of a community because your individualism is important. A, a lot of the nuns are people who grew up in church and are like, well, why am I here then? Like if it's just Jesus and me, or if it's Jesus needing to make me happy, or if it's just Jesus needing to give me psychological comfort, or Jesus needing to forgive my personal sins, what, why am I, I can, just, I can have that outside of all these rules and having all these other people to bump into. So I think a big, a, a big reason at the heart of this is individualism. And if individualism is correct, that the individual is the most important, and I agree with them. Like, why go to church? What's the point? But the question is, is individualism correct? And it's not what we're talking about today, I know. So I, I don't want to get us down a rabbit hole. I, I don't think it is. I think that we were made for community, which means that we were made to have some, at least some sort of restrictions and boundaries in our life. And because of that, I, I still continue to believe in uh, the absolute necessity of the Christian church. You know, as long as people have existed, which is a pretty long time, they have faced difficult perplexing questions about the meaning and purpose of life. Many have turned to invented gods for answers. Old Testament and New Testament people have turned to the God of Scriptures for these answers. In the middle of the 19th century, however, the science of psychology emerged. And now, maybe the human mind contains the answers to our questions. Can psychology satisfy our pursuit of meaning and purpose? Psychology... Well, so let me let, let me answer the, the the question last. I want to say two things about this. Psychology pr provides a valuable, extremely valuable resource for raising the right sorts of questions. 
And here's what I mean. You know, we started off talking about is Christianity a crutch? This is one of the common accusations of it is that organized religion in our culture, specifically Christianity, is a crutch that people need to get through their lives. It's kind of for the weaker minded. Us strong individuals, we don't need things like organized religion or people. To, we don't need to be told, you know, if you do it, be a good boy, that you can go to heaven when you die. We don't need that. You just go and you take care of your business and you live your life. If you're strong and you're self-reliant, you don't need Christianity. And what psychology can do is it can say, so a lot of times Christians will say, that's not true. My Christianity is not a crutch. Uh, actually, though, it's better just to say with what you know, psychology has pointed out to us that every human being needs a crutch. There's no human being who's completely self-reliant. We all are weak and we need something to lean on. Everybody needs something to get them out of bed in the morning, else they'll just stop getting out of bed in the morning. Everybody needs some sort of purpose or meaning. And if the purpose of a person is, uh, and we're going to run through the list that we, I feel like we always end up talking about in here. Like if your purpose is academic success, like I want to be top achiever at school, that'll get you up in the morning. But academic success then becomes a crutch. It becomes a crutch. And psychology can point out to you why that's important. Why is it important that you need that sort of purpose and meaning in your life? And I've done quite a bit of counseling with students for whom uh, academic success was their psychological crush. This is not, it's a super common problem in our uh, highly driven, success oriented culture. Somebody makes that their goal. And it's especially if you've got highly driven, economically successful parents who are paying lots of money for you to have academic success and putting pressure on you to get good grades. And then you don't. There have been kids who have committed suicide because of poor grades. And what that shows us, and psychologists can tell us where this comes from and why and actually how it works in practice in their lives, is that academic success was their crutch. Maybe they weren't religious. Maybe they were religious. But academic success was their crutch. It's the same thing with financial success. It's the same thing with um, um, uh, you, you know, being physically active and physically healthy. There are a lot of people who start working out and get in shape. It becomes a big deal to them. They become very serious about it. You know, maybe they maybe they train to run marathons, or maybe they have a goal of looking a certain way or pressing a certain weight, and then they get hurt. Then they, they tear their ACL or their rotator cuff rips, and they don't just say, "Well, okay." I guess I'm going to have to do something. They actually will fall into depression because that had become their crutch. And I'm not saying it's bad. What psychologists tell us is that everybody needs a crutch. You have to have one. And But Christians, Christianity functions like that for me. I'll say this personally, is that I freely admit that your while your crutch might be academic success or financial success or physical attractiveness or being physically in shape or whatever it is, having a, you know, a, a, a great looking house, I don't know, whatever it is, I need something bigger than that. I personally need to know that the creator God is on my side and is happy with me and loves me, which I, I do know this is true for the sake of Jesus Christ, the creator God loves me. And that gives me purpose and meaning but because the creator God is up to something bigger than me. He's up to this worldwide mission to rescue the entire universe back to himself for righteousness and justice and mercy and love. And that gets me out of bed in the morning. That's a crutch. Yes. So that's the first part of the answer is that psychology can very, very much help us in this. But the, you go ahead. You got one well, to chime in there. What, what your commentary is causing me to do is revise somewhat my general understanding of the term crutch. To me, crutch is pretty much just a negative. So if yes, you know somebody, so somebody, uh, somebody on the team got hurt. Oh, really? Did they? Yeah, they're on crutches. Oh, right. oh, that's yeah. bad. Or if I were to say to you, um, Pastor, I'm glad you have your Christianity to offer truth and purpose and meaning to your life. However, my hope for you is that you will grow and mature to the higher level that science has to offer so that you can leave your Christian crutch behind right, so yes, that yeah. you can discard it because, and let me just add this thought since we talked a little bit about individualism when we started, 
I'm kind of thinking that individualism and the aspiration of individualism is to attain a crutch-free existence where I don't have to lean on anything or depend on anybody. Yeah. Um, so maybe I should stop thinking of crutch as a distinctly negative word, and maybe I should not aspire to be so crutch-free. That's, right. kind of, that's kind of a strange thing to think about, I think. Right. Well, I, it's, you know, cr- crutches, that's a great way to look at it. It's actually, it, and what, you know, you, you bring up the analogy of an actual physical crutch brings up the two visions of humanity that it highlights. And it points us forward too to your, 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 your you know, your observation right there about is the crutch perhaps a positive? There's two ways of looking at humanity. One is the modern way, I mean, the enlightenment way, which is that humans are basically on their own wonderful athletes. I don't mean necessarily physically. Some people aren't very good athletes, but we're just perfect. You know, we're just fine. And if we could just see that we're fine, we wouldn't need a crutch like religion. I actually side with the postmodernist on this though, that humans aren't, maybe there's something, Christianity would insist that there's something, uh, uh, there's, there's the remains of a fine athlete about the human, but in our current state, we're more lame than anything else. We're kind of broken down. So we need crutches. This is what psychologists tell us. Human beings need crutches. Well, is that a negative or a positive? Well, it's kind of a negative. It's no fun to like sit on the sidelines while you, you know, you you could be playing football, but it's, you know, you're sitting on the sidelines, but also the crutch actually helps you move around. It it helps you, uh, you know, be able to get to class. It helps you be able to get to work. It helps you be able to get to rehab. And what Christianity does is it actually provides a training tool for healing it's actually a part of our process of becoming whole again, to becoming an athlete. And in this life, we'll never, ever be a perfect athlete. But the crutch is not there to hinder us. The crutch is there to support us and help us. And so to look at it as both, it's a negative, it's a sign that we need help, but it's also a positive. Help is coming. Help is available. We are going to get better in Jesus. I think that's a great, I, I think that's a fine way to look at it, Chuck. In this Probably somebody listening to us who, at least at this moment, feels pretty good about his individual condition. Uh, He has or she has eliminated all the crutches in his or her life so that it's it's kind of a good feeling. Uh, I've arrived, and we know life can set a new obstacle down the road, but right now, crutch-free, and you know what? I'm not looking for any crutches either. We seem to be blowing that away. Well, yeah. I mean, this is, uh, yeah. I, the, the point is, is that there there are no crutch-free pre- people. Christians, though, are people who say, yes, we need crutches. Yes, God is a crutch. My support is Jesus. Well, now when you say God is a crutch, that just triggers that negative understanding of the word crutch in my mind. And that sounds like a personal sound, problem. To me. Doesn't sound, <laughs> we need a psychologist. Uh, doesn't sound like a very uh, kind way to describe God. It's not. Uh, you know, it, it's 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 not a fun way. It's if you assume that I don't need the crutch, then it's it, it's a bad analogy. If you assume we do need a crutch, then having somebody come along and support us is great. It's great, and. Um, I think it probably probes around at that part of us that thinks that we're okay. And what I'm saying is, and what the psychologists say as well, is that nobody's crutch free. And if somebody says to me, I'm living life great, I'm crutch free, it just shows an incredible lack of self awareness on their part because what they're not doing is they're not asking, why is it that I need to work so hard? Then why is it that it's so important that I'm attracted to the opposite sex? But, 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 but these are not bad things. It's not bad to be attractive. It's not bad to work hard. But they do function as crutches. You cannot possibly say, I don't need anything. I don't need any more money. I don't need a house. I don't need friends. I, I don't need intimacy. I don't need food. Everybody needs something to survive. And whatever that something is, it's a crutch. And Christians just say, yes, that's us. We know that our crutch has to be God. Now, sometimes there are people, this is very, very rare, but there are people sometimes who will acknowledge and say, yep, 
I reject Christianity because I needed a crutch. But most people don't do that. Most people say Christian, most atheists will say Christianity is a crutch. I don't need a crutch. But there's this fantastic quote. I'll give it to you now. And I've quoted it to, to my uh, to church before in sermons. It's by Aldous Huxley, who is a fantastically brilliant atheist and you know British philosopher and author and all around weirdo in the 20th century, up to about the middle of the 20th century, died in uh, 1963. And he talks about abandoning his Christianity uh, when he went to college. But it wasn't because Christianity was a crutch. It's because he needed a different kind of crutch. This is what he says. He says, I had motives for not wanting the world to have a meaning and consequently assumed that it had none and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. So I didn't want the world to have meaning, and that's why I rejected Christianity, because I needed the world to have no meaning. And so I just said Christianity is not true. That's why it wasn't rational. I didn't look for proofs. I wasn't logically argued into, well, God must not exist. I just didn't want him to exist, so I decided he didn't exist. He'll tell you why in a second. The philosopher who finds no meaning in the world is not concerned exclusively with the problem in pure metaphysics. He's not just doing philosophy and logic. He's also concerned to prove that there's no valid reason why he personally should not do as he wants to do. So Huxley says, I abandon Christianity because I, I needed a crutch. Atheism functions for me as a crutch to support my desire to do whatever I want to do and not have anybody tell me that I shouldn't do it. He goes on. Straight back to the Garden of Eden. Yeah, for myself, as no doubt for most of my friends, the philosophy of meaningless was essentially an instrument of liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. The supporters of this system, Christianity, claimed that it embodied the meaning, the Christian meaning they insisted of the world. There was one admirably simple method of confuting these people and justifying ourselves in our erotic revolt. We would deny that the world had any meaning, whatever. I love that quote because it is so refreshingly honest. He just says, I wanted to have sex with whoever I wanted to, and Christianity said I couldn't. I needed that crutch of sexual liberation, and so I became an atheist to support that. To be and, God, to be my own God. Right, yeah. And so, yeah, so what he's saying is, is that we all need crutches. He's just, he's just transparent about what his crutch is. You don't find many people like that though. Although if you probe deep down inside, that's what's going on. Now for Huxley, it's erotic freedom. For some, it might be financial freedom or something like, like you know, academic freedom. We talked about people who are driven for success. It could be something like that. But at some point they will say, that's going to be the purpose of my life. And God stands in the way. God says to every student, your grades are not ultimate. You are not your grades. And I've counseled students before too. I had one girl who attempted suicide because of poor grade situation. Um, this is about several years ago. And I counseled her. I didn't think, I don't think she did it. And she's doing, she is thriving and doing well today. Not because of my counseling, but because God's good. I should say that she's a Christian believer. She was then too. Um, I counsel her like, you just need to bomb a test. You just need to do it. You need to like sit there and say, it's okay. Like I'm infinitely loved by God and, in Jesus Christ, my grades don't define me. But for most people, grappling with that crutch doesn't happen. They just, you know, blissfully unaware that they are dependent upon anything. And meanwhile, they become more and more enslaved to it. Though Christians, though, say we are, of course, we are lame. We need a crutch. Our crutch is Jesus Christ. Well, let's talk about thinking now. We're in the realm of psychology. We're in the realm of the human mind. When we as Christians are faced with the big questions in life, that being purpose, meaning, human value, we activate our minds. We activate our thinking. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says, and I'm quoting, For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? And here's the part I want to focus on. But we, Paul says, have the mind of Christ. So what's the difference between the Christian who has the mind of Christ and the unbeliever who does not, or is there no difference? Well, this is a huge, this is maybe an episode in itself too. Uh, just to touch on a few things here. What is it? So obviously people have minds. Every human being has a mind. You can't live without a mind. Um, what is it? What's the difference between the mind of Christ and the, the, the mind without Christ? 
if, if we go back, if we wanted to take the time, if this was a Bible study podcast, we could take the time to go back and look at the context in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, which is there's two ways of looking at the world. There's the world's way. Embody, so this is Paul speaking in the first century of our era now. Embodied by Greeks whose primary goal is to get wisdom. And the Jews, whose primary goal is to look for power. Remember that the Jews wanted political liberation from Rome. So what they were looking for was power. And this is not, this is, uh, the, the, these two are not hermetically sealed from each other. Lots of times wisdom and power go hand in hand. And most people want both. Uh, you know, I do. Um, but the way of the world is to say, how can my brain be more powerful or how can I have more personal power? Whether it's individual power or some sort of political power. I, I don't mean even just like you vote for me and I do stuff, but like how can I have power over the office place? You know, power over other people is what I mean. Um, for, for the Christian though, that sort of wisdom and power are ultimately meaningless on their own because they only turn back on themselves. Let me tell you what I mean. The world's wisdom. Oh, actually, let, let's, this is a good example. We'll talk, let's go back to psychology from a few minutes ago. And I and I had said that psychology. Uh, you know, you had said there's a suggestion that maybe we, we don't need Christianity because psychology can tell us about humans. That's true, but it's 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 the uh, it assumes that the only thing we need to know about is humans. One of one of psychology's problems, science in general and philosophy in general, is that it turns back in on itself. All that, all that philosophy, all that, well, let's stick with psychology. I don't want to make this too big. All that psychology can do is tell us how the human brain can work. It is the observation of the human mind and human, you know, if you can expand it to social psychology and human interaction with other humans. But it can't ever get beyond that. The wisdom of the world can try and dip down into the human mind, but it can't escape the bonds of eminence. It can't get through what we can see and hear and think about and examine ourselves to ultimate reality. Well, okay, so how do you get to ultimate reality? If we're humans and we're trapped here, lots of this is a big topic in philosophy. How do you know things if humans are completely incapable of knowing everything? How can you ever know that what you know is really knowledge? This is, a, we call this epistemology. And, and the answer for psychology and philosophy is you just can't know. Same thing with science. All you can know is what you can observe. You can know what you can observe, but do you know what it means? Do you know what the ethical implications of it are? You know, like John Lennox says, uh, uh, science can tell you that arsenic can kill, but science can't tell you whether it's appropriate or not to use that arsenic on your grandma. It's, it, it doesn't give you any ultimate meaning. It just it describes the world to you. Philosophy, psychology can describe our brains, describe our social interactions, describe human behavior, but it can't actually get us past the human. Well, what, is the, what does the cross of Jesus Christ have to do with this? Paul says that ultimate wisdom is the cross of Jesus. Here's what he means. There is one human that can break out of this because there's one human who's both human, so he knows what it's like to have a human brain and human interactions and human behavior and human relationships, but he's also God. So he's got one foot. This is a bad, bad, this is not a Chalcedonian analogy. He's got one foot. In divinity, which is not true. He's got both feet in divinity and both feet in humanity. But you I know what I mean? What you mean. He functions as a bridge between both. So he actually can. It is at the cross of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ where we have the one and only portal offered to humans to understanding things bigger than ourselves. And I, I don't just mean like, even if you're studying outer space, okay, somebody's going to say, well, outer space is bigger than us and we understand that. We don't really. We understand our own sensations and our own observations of outer space. But we don't know, you know, how fast is the universe expanding, uh, how many galaxies there are. And what and, we do know, we've just learned in the last couple of hundred years. I know. And it's going to be revised very quickly. The more, the better telescopes we get and the smarter people we get with the better experience. And so we, we do have something that's bigger than ourselves in Jesus of Christ. And so Paul says to have the mind of Christ is actually the pathway forwards to ultimate psychology, to ultimate philosophy, to ultimate science, because we have a portal to the transcendent in Jesus. So for Christians, this sort of thing is, it's its not a crutch. It's just recognizing that psychology is very, very important. Philosophy and science, very, very important. 
but ultimately they can only describe us. It's the wisdom of man. It's, the, it's literally the wisdom of humans. It's valuable, but are we all that there is? No, we all sense that there's something more than us. There's something bigger. There's something transcendent and infinite. And Christianity in Jesus Christ provides a pathway to that ultimate wisdom, even if we personally don't have it. I don't, I don't know the mysteries of the universe, but I've been baptized into and connected to the one who does. And that is ultimate wisdom. So follow my logic here and then let me know what you think. We go back to the fall of Adam and Eve and sin enters the world. Sin enters the creation. And from that point on, Adam and Eve are corrupt. And I was just reading in Romans last night how uh, all descendants of Adam and Eve bear that corruption. Nobody has emerged in in that line who was not corrupt. Right. That corruption includes the human mind. Yep. So everybody who comes into this life has a mind that is broken. Right. Just like the rest of everything else. Yep. When a person becomes a Christian and believes in Jesus, lots of things change, but we don't start getting any younger. We don't stop being sick. We right. still suffer through these things. Yep. What about thinking? What about the human mind? So a person becomes a Christian and their corrupt mind, uh, the, the way they used to think, the way they used to address these big questions right is it fixed is it adjusted is it on the periphery it just you know what's better a little bit what becoming how fixed. big is the mind of christ in a human being it, 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 it's becoming fixed our bodies too as well let me just make this point is that when people come to christ their bodies start to be getting fixed if what's wrong with their body is a result of human sin um if if, if you come to jesus with a slavery to food and he says, food is a good gift, but it's going to kill you if it's your master. Come to me and let me be your owner. Let me be your crutch. People can be liberated from slavery to food. This will add years to their life. If people come, if people come to Christianity with a slavery to sexual, like uh, if Huxley, um, it will add psychological health, mental health, physical health to their life if they abandon the crutch crutch of sexual promiscuity and turn to Jesus. This is all related to the mind as well, of course. Um, does Christianity mean that we're right about everything? Absolutely not. Our minds are still broken. And even broken, broken is one way to look at it. That's true. We, th we think wrong things. Limited is another way to look at it. We can't know everything. So, but, but, but being in, being in Christ Starting to live in the mind of Christ and have the mind of Christ live in us does something quite remarkable and, and, and way more drastic than just, I used to think wrong things and now I think right things. The wisdom of the world, like I said, and everybody thinks this, we all think this, is something that happens in my head. I need to understand in my head. And that's because the wisdom of humans is human wisdom. It's wisdom about humans, wisdom bound by human limitations. It has to happen in our head. How can I be wise outside of my head? Wisdom has to happen in my, I have to, something I have to know. And what the mind of Christ does is it's no longer human wisdom in the sense that it's mine and it's about me. It's now Christ wisdom in the sense that it's Christ wisdom and it's about him. And what that means is that the locus of wisdom, I'm making motions with my hands, which aren't helpful on a podcast, the locus of our wisdom goes from between our ears to a person. The, the wisdom is not something that I'm controlling inside my brain, but it's a person outside of me. It's Jesus. And I can give that to him. And what that does is it starts to radically alter my demand to be able to know and explain things that are unexplainable. I can know and explain things I need to explain because God's given me that knowledge and given me the ability of it. If you you know, if you're an auto mechanic, what you need to know is how cars work. That's the wisdom that God has ordained for you, and he's given human beings the understanding to know about machinery and the creativity to create elaborate machines and to, to understand them. That wisdom, I, I see that now as not something that I own, but as a gift from God outside of me. In addition to that, the things that I don't know, I am now comfortable with. 
It doesn't keep me up at night that I do not know the solution to the problem of evil. That will never fit in my head, never. But what it is, the solution to the problem of evil, it will never fit in my head, but it can fit in this other person. It can fit in Jesus of Nazareth. This, the, the wisdom of being on the cross, suffering for the evil of the world, it doesn't, I, I can never understand how that works. But he has promised me that he has swallowed up the evil of the world. Not just the evil that's happened in the past, but the evil that's happening now and the evil that will happen in the future. He has swallowed that up in his body. And to have the mind of Christ, it's, it's, don't, don't, we, we shouldn't put that in our old person framework where, okay, so now I can fit Christ in my head. No, no, it means your mind is now given over to Christ. Your wisdom and your sanctification, as it says at the end of chapter one, and your redemption, that's a, that's a person. It's not something you control. It's an outside person. And that begins to radically alter the way we even look at the world and ourselves and the freedom we have, the, the ability to, for instance, the ability to say, yes, it's totally a crutch. I, I need this outside person now. I, I can't exist without Jesus. Except for the it's, before it was like we were lame, we were crippled, but we still kept trying to crawl out there onto the football field thinking that we were healthy because I can fit all this wisdom in my head. And that's just turned the human being into just a hot, lousy mess. And instead what we're called to is this mind of Christ that gives him, that calls him wisdom and allows him to be our, our capital C crutch in all the, all the best senses of the word. So you've described a change for a human being, an unbelieving human being who becomes a Christian where something happens to that person that comes from the outside and leads to the renewal of the human mind. Right. I think we've covered that pretty well. Let's go back to the person who is on the other side of that fence, the person we've sort of described in this discussion, the person who may look down on other people because of, you know, you're a Christian or you have religion. That's, that's too bad. Sorry to hear that. Or the person who is maybe even actually hostile and, you know, wants to take you on, wants to prove you wrong. Here's a reading from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is verses 3 through 5. It says, And even if the gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, those who are perishing, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So this seems to be saying, as we've been talking about the person who has the broken mind, the inability to process things as they really are when you see them through the lens of Christ— it's not just part of the human not just part of the human condition but the god of this world satan is actively involved in obstructing this person from seeing the wisdom that we've been talking about so it's not just talking to your neighbor and trying to think through or talk through yep. this there's an enemy on the scene that's complicating the situation and what are you going to do with him because according to this he blinds the minds the minds of unbelievers. Yeah, I mean, so Jesus is stronger than him. That's the first thing. So uh, we, we shouldn't stress out about it too much. Paul's point here, though, is that prepare that people will look at you like you're an idiot. It's the same point back in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that's the text that you read earlier, chapters 1 and 2. If I say, uh, you know what, my wisdom doesn't happen in my head. My wisdom is Jesus of Nazareth who died and rose for me. People will look at me like I'm speaking a foreign language. It's and Paul says it explicitly in First Corinthians one. This the the, the preaching I'm even of the cross. I'm tempted to laugh, and I know better. Yeah, the preaching of the cross is foolishness. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. So, what does that mean? It means that what for for Christians trying to explain what it is that is their wisdom and encourage others to abandon their old wisdoms for this new wisdom. We're not asking people to tweak a couple things here, change your ideas about a few things. Hey, try out Jesus, add Jesus to the mix. It's this radical, complete alternate way of living and thinking and being in community and having feelings and worshiping and all sorts and going to work and all sorts of things. So just to be encouraged that, and I'm a big believer, like, okay, so if we can talk practical things, I'm a big believer in asking probing questions to try and get people to see where the holes in their own worldviews are. I don't, I would not start off with like, 
Jesus is my wisdom. Come, you know, give yourself, to, give your life to Jesus. Um, because people are just going to be like, that's stupid. Why would I want that sort of slavery? But I think one thing we can do is to say, okay, so you think this is a crutch, but what about your own crutches? And how happy has it made you? How fulfilled are you? How, how, how much, how close do you think you are to being good? I don't mean like morally good, but like having a good life with, you know, you, you've, with whatever your happy pursuits with are. Yourself. Are you happy with yourself? Yeah. And I think that if we can start to show people, I've got chinks in my armor. I thought that Christians, I thought that they needed a crutch, but we all do actually. The Christians that like, and so let me thought, what, what, what are my crutches? That's a great question. What are your crutches? And to start just maybe creating some space where there are some questions about how I've lived my life up to this point. How's the pursuit of wisdom going for you? You know, we're, uh, we're 2,500 years in here to the Western philosophical project. You know, you can go back to, uh, to Socrates on forward. And how, clo- how much closer are we to being positive that we are becoming wiser as a human race? I don't think we are. And I'm not saying ph- philosophy is super important, but is it really doing what we thought it could do just by ourselves without reference to God? And then to say, that there's this new alternate reality. Come live with me in my community for a little bit. Come, come be friends with me, and let's look at what it would look like if you didn't have to be so wise in your own mind. What would it look like if you didn't actually need the power that your heart's telling you that it needs? And see if the Holy Spirit starts opening up people's minds and the, the eyes of their minds to the glory of the wisdom that's in Jesus Christ. And, and listening to his voice say, come, you know, come to me, you, those of you who are worn out and tired And I can give you rest. I think that's probably the best path forward for us Christians who are talking to people like this. Thanks for listening to Craving Answers, Craving God. If you would like to suggest a topic for discussion or if you have a question that you'd like Aaron to address, please email us at cacg at stjamesglencarbon.org. Feel free to share your comments and criticisms as well. For Pastor Aaron Miller and Production Manager Larry O'Leary, I'm Chuck Rathard.